for VCTV. Welcome back to another exciting episode. And in some cases, to the next frontier for all of my uh, Trekkie fans out there. Today, we are talking about something incredible, something that we have been talking about since the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, in science fiction, in reality, everything in between. But it is now something that is here and here to be paying attention to. That is space and deep technologies. Every episode here on VCTV, we talk about various technologies and industries and how they are affecting each other along with investing in those industries. What opportunities, what trends, and what you can do to be successful in each of those. And we wanted to come back to deep technologies. And deep technologies, when we talk about that today, and our panelists will go further in explaining it, but what I want to set the stage with is we're talking about these Technology is not necessarily focused on end users, the customers. Instead, they help power or empower uh, the various technology or the various devices, software, and our everyday lives. We're talking about artificial intelligence, which we spoke a little bit about yesterday. We're talking about robotics. We're talking about advanced material sciences. So even getting into the details of you know 3D printing to biotech, other topics we've covered, and one of my personal favorites, blockchain, but not to be forgotten, quantum computing. So a lot of these may be buzzwords you've heard in and around the news, but today we're actually going to go and unpack those and go one step further to space. Space exploration is not just about going to space and space travel, but we actually want to look at how the space industry is moving and shifting and where the opportunities are. Right now, according to Forbes Business Insights, who just released a report yesterday, uh, the space launch industry itself is expected to be almost $32 billion by 2026. We've talked again a lot about these different industries and technologies and how they are going to be bigger and bigger coming towards that 2025 and 26 year. So we want to get you ready. So we brought on some of the brightest and some of the best in the industry that are making investments in all of these areas to share with you what's happening to get you prepared. But before we start, thank you for joining in as, as always. If you have comments, questions, feel free to drop them in the box as we are live. I'll do my best to ask them in real time. If not, we're all available as you'll find out on social media and we'll do our best to uh, follow up with you afterwards. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and also a shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team for making VCTV possible and bringing us all together into your screen to share all we're going to today. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our guests who are going to be the experts talking and sharing about this. Uh, and without further ado, Arena, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, if you could, just an introduction on yourself and a little background. Yes, um, it's such a pleasure to be back. Um, we we got to touch we got to touch on space a little bit in our uh, past conversation. So I've been really looking forward to it. Um, I'm founder of Lumeri. It's my new company. Uh, its goal is to um, connect uh, investors and projects and really make sure that space as an asset class becomes a reality. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm a founding, I'm, I'm founding advisor of a global securities exchange. Um, I'm an advisor on space fund, pro chain capital. It's a hedge fund in, from New York. And um, I'm founder of Blockchain Cubed. It's a financial technology consulting um, firm. I've been in payments and financial technology for 15 years. I'm driven by innovation and really kind of a, Global capital markets and innovation and capital markets is what drives me. And why space? Because for global capital markets, we need to create real true global capital markets. We must have something that is a golden key. And I believe that space is an asset class is that golden key. So I'm driven of bringing that innovation into hands of, of people. Absolutely. And it's no longer just one country versus another, the ultimate, or as we know, the historical space race. It's now something that everybody, both public and private market, can get into uh, as well, which is exciting to dive into. And I'm, I'm 
I am very energetic to hear more of your thoughts in this area. And on the blockchain note, for those that haven't heard, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, you know, Coinbase just announced the idea of going public and becoming a publicly listed company today. So big, big news uh, that made waves in the blockchain and cryptocurrency or digital currency markets as well. So we'll come back to that and other things. But um, Gary, my man. The yeah. AI guru of the world back on the show two days in a row, ladies and gentlemen, paying attention and keeping track at home. We've brought him back. He got everything when it comes to artificial intelligence, told us everything about future of smart homes yesterday and smart assistants. But Gary, welcome back to the show. I don't want to steal any more of your thunder. A little introduction and a little background on, on you as well. Yeah, sure. So my name's Gary Fowler. I've done 15 companies. My most successful exit, I was on the original management team of Click Software, which was sold for $1.35 billion seven months ago. Um, I'm passionate about artificial intelligence, as you know, Kyle. Uh, I've started a company four years ago, Evo, which is one of the top 10 HRAI companies in the world with a guy by the name of David Yang out of Russia. It's in Silicon Valley. So I'm passionate. I love it. I mean, if we look at it, you know, we talk about space. There are 40 billion Earth-like planets in a Goldilocks zone. And the, and the closest one is 12 uh, light years away. So how do we get there? And I'll talk about that a bit longer. So I'm very, very intrigued because the same technologies we talked about yesterday with the home are the, some of the same technologies that we're going to need to have a howl in space. <laughs> and if you didn't tune in, definitely check that episode out after today. And Hal, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. We also talked a little bit about Jarvis, Iron Man. These things are actually in place. And Gary, I won't steal his thunder, but he's got some examples. Let me just put it that way. Noble, welcome back to the show as well. Excited to have you. You've got a whole new mic set up. This is I know. I know. Hopefully you can hear me better, Kyle. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. It's perfect. Intro and a little background on yourself, my friend. Uh, you know, uh, my name is Noble Dracon. I, I'm the uh, founder and managing partner of Dracon Capital Partners. And uh, prior to that, I ran a hedge, $30 million hedge fund in the commodities space. Uh, I, I constantly have been doing consulting. Uh, now I'm teamed up with M Accelerator. Uh, LA. We have a M Accelerator Fund, Venture Fund One, that we're raising 15 million for from uh, credit investors. And uh, after that, we're going to uh, institutional and family offices for the additional 25 million. You know, when this popped up uh, about talking about space and venture fund uh, and, and what it looks like uh, for the future, and I'm happy to see Gary here, uh, you know, brilliant as always. Uh, it's something that I've been near and dear to my heart for one of the early companies that I invested in, worked with Ad Astra, and I don't know if you know the International Space uh, Society, uh, the National Space Association, but we've been actually working with uh, them for quite some time. We've actually put out their magazine, we've gone to a lot of their futurist conferences, uh, met Buzz, uh, Buzz Aldrin, everybody. So uh, the, the feeling of where things are gonna go uh, in that community has been a constant fight between not only the stars, but you know, inhabiting our local solar system. Are we going to the moon? Or are we going to Mars? And uh, I, you know, I think that that's really the key. And I believe a lot of the technology uh, and the drive of really focusing on near space is really the key in, in tapping into creating our first uh, off-world site, and that's the moon. And I think that that you know, so I think there's a lot of technologies and a lot of opportunities there. Our fund focuses primarily on augmented reality and virtual reality technology, uh, as well as multimedia and fintech. But I believe that there's an intersection between, you know, you mentioned Jarvis and you mentioned, uh, you know, how, I think there's an interface between what true interstellar space flight looks like. I think will be more akin to something like Avatar, as opposed to uh, actually going there physically in which we will run and operate both machines and uh, simulcra and and literally avatars on off-world sites and that's the only way these intergenerational moves will go you know gary brought it up there's 40,000 goldilocks planets the reality is that we have a lot of the technology to get us there and a lot of nascent technology between lenders and, and etc so it is an exciting opportunity but i do believe that 
augmented reality and virtual reality or XR, extended reality, plays a key part in making that a true fruition for human beings because the human vessel is, is, is just uh, uh, too fragile, I believe, for space. Absolutely. I'm, I'm speechless because it is so exciting and I'm trying not to nerd out with you, but, uh, you know, to your point, I think that, you know, go big or go home, but at the same time, a lot of the technologies that we have to previous episodes, these things have been accelerated. They have been advanced. In some cases, what we're going to be talking about today further beyond space, deep technologies are more advanced than we'll give them credit for, or will be in the coming years as things are continuing to accelerate. So, a lot of those technologies can be applied to the stars and to other things that we're looking at doing, uh, helping us go uh, beyond this beautiful blue world that we uh, currently live in today and uh, see what's next. And with that, Wally, my dear friend, welcome as well back, or welcome to the show for the first time. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And I know you focus a lot on not just space, but deep technologies like quantum and edge and some of those areas you and I've had conversations with. Quick introduction and also a little background on yourself uh, as well. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Kyle, for uh, having me. So first time here. Um, so my name is Wally Wang. Um, I'm currently managing a, a, a macro VC called Scale Asia Ventures. Um, basically, the uh, from the LP side is actually pretty interesting. Is uh, Asian American and also from strategic corporates in Asia. Um, so it's actually a pretty smart money trying to put a little bit in the early stage and trying to scale the company together uh, for the following rounds. So uh, my focus right now is on the. Um, uh, uh, most of them are in the deep tech. Um, I don't have much experience in the space, but in deep tech, I specifically focus on bell tech and med tech. So that's a like drug discovery using AI and those uh, new diagnostic tools. And uh, like Kyle mentioned, I also look at the uh, extension of the cloud at the edge computing where like, the cybersecurity and uh, DevOps tools are taking more um, basically important roles in exploring those new um, like edge computing scenarios. And uh, I've also um, focused on pretty much everything related to AI. So I have a lot of common interest shared uh, with uh, Gary. So looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Um, prior to becoming an investor, I primarily focused on the uh, 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 operating side. So I was uh, heading a few uh, Silicon Valley startups to uh, expand to Asia. Uh, running their Asia business. So uh, expanding, setting off offices in uh, Singapore, China, Southeast Asia, and also South Korea um, um, in vertical, uh, and quite a few um, vertical industries, including financial services, insurance, and internet in general. So, um, and um, yeah, my, my academic background is actually in the uh, data mining and uh, machine learning. So I had a, uh, was doing my PhD at Stern Business School in New York. Um, so it's a, it's a great honor to see, to witness the whole world is becoming digitalized, digitalized and also becoming more intelligent by, in, uh, I mean, leveraging those uh, new tax happening in the past decade. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Excited to have you. This is going to be a fun episode for our audience. Get ready. All right. So Without further ado, let's kick off with our very first question. And I think really just to kind of set the stage is what's happening in these industries, right? So what's happening when it comes to space? Where are we when it comes to deep technologies? There's so much shifting and changing and rapidly happening to Wally's point around the digitization of so many businesses, of so many industries that now things that we call deep tech. So again, blockchain, artificial intelligence, computing, whether that at the edge or quantum, et cetera, they're all now starting to play a role. They matter. They're not just a part of the conversation. They're actually a part of the business. They're a part of the plan. But to each of you, what are the current states of some of these areas respectfully? And we can, we can start with space or you can start with uh, the broader picture of deep tech. And, uh, you know, Irina, let's come to you first. Where are we when it comes to these tech? And uh, I'll let you kind of lead that uh, as you will. Well, when, let's let's touch up on the blockchain first, since it's much easier subject than space, which which is really interesting because it was not a case um, only a couple of years ago. Um, we're we're really seeing 
huge adoption and adoption really in acceptance of governments as well. And I think that's really important pivots uh, and kind of a, you know, when we, when we think about blockchain technology, uh, only seven years ago, six years ago, five years ago, it was questionable whether Bitcoin is going to be legal or not, right? So when you were going and raising money, if you were a blockchain company, for the most part, investors were asking that question. Now it's not a question. It's very well understood. And most importantly, regu regulators starting to understand that there are benefits for implementation of this technology. And I think that's a very big leap because when we see regulators accepting this and when we see uh, regulators for capital markets starting to understand that it is something that can save money, that can be transparent, that can actually allow them to do their work better, I think that kind of allows us to have a next big leap. Um, and it's happening all over the world. And I think that that's very important. So that's kind of the biggest thing that I would like um, everybody to carry out is understanding that it is becoming well understood. People are not scared about it. And they understand that there is a technology that it's not only the currency, which was kind of the use case only a couple years ago. Right. So now we have a huge rush uh, of corporations trying to adopt it and seeing who is going to benefit from it. Um, obviously, there's a lot to go more forward, um, but, you know, it, we are we are implementing this technology now. Well, I, I think we talked on our last show as well. The, the Deloitte, Deloitte did a survey recently, their global blockchain survey for the third year in a row. So 2018, 2019, 2020. And uh, this year they saw, I believe it was over 40%. I'll get the exact number for our audience later, but just over 40% of corporations saying, this is a must, like absolutely. It's already in our implementation stack. We're already moving forward with it. Whereas a high percentage, so above 60%, we'll just leave it at that. So this is absolutely something we have to consider. And it's yeah. something we're planning for. How and what, we're still figuring that out, which is okay. Blockchain, as with other of these technologies we're going to be talking about, may not always be a fit, right? AI may be a better fit for you and yeah. others as well. But the point is to, to Irina, what you're saying is, you're right, adoption is there and it's not just 2018, let's talk about it. Let's put out a press release. It's right. not 2019 of like, hey, let's just pilot things. It's, no, this is, this is here. In most cases, you'll never know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Actual implementation. Yes. And it, it's important to understand that a lot of companies are already benefiting from it as well. So it's, it's not kind of a, it's no longer a marketing tool to, for fundraising, if you would, um, as it was before, but actually um, a solutions. And one important thing to understand when it comes to blockchain, we do have permissioned and permissionless technologies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of enterprises are using permissioned uh, technology already, right? Because it really goes very well with, uh, with their business spaces. Um, and permissioned, for permissioned blockchains are doing very well. Um, there is a huge integration between space and uh, blockchain as well. Obviously, supply chain is extremely important. Um, understanding where your minerals come from to the parts is crucial. Um, you know, rockets are expensive, and failure in <laughs> rockets is extremely expensive as well. So we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of kind of implementation in that area. It's still not very cost effective. So it's not something that saves companies money, but they're still using it. Another thing that is used in the space and what is needed um, is payments in space, because what is happening is that there are a lot of companies that um, that need that are kind of doing servicing in space and they need to be able to exchange the value. Right. And so kind of a payment system um, is something that is much needed. Um, now I would like to go to space um, industry and what kind of happening in space. Um, I would like to mention that 
one of the problems, and I want to go with the problems because I really want people to understand this, that launching platforms are overfunded and we don't need that many launching platforms. So if you are an entrepreneur, do not go and build another launching platform, but see how you can create a company that can provide servicing in space, right? You can, we, we have enough funding in, in that. And Megan Crawford, a managing partner of Space Fund, wrote a great article about that. And in the space industry, it is actually feared that it is overinflated and then it create, it kind of can pop as a bubble. And people are concerned that there's overfunding in the launch and underfunding in other uh, companies. On a good note, we're starting to see a real ecosystem. We're starting to see creation of space as an asset class. Almost every day, I see yet another fund investing in early stage to mid stage companies. And it is extremely important because the way the industry worked before was really kind of a early stage bootstrap, get the grants and start working with NASA or other big companies. And it is a problem. In order for us to drive innovation, we must make sure that there is an infrastructure, financial infrastructure to allow these companies to go from early stage to mid stage to public as well. And so that's what my company is concentrating in. And I just am so grateful to see that there's so many people are opening their minds to the opportunities that are there and, and pivoting and starting to consider investing in A round, B round, C round companies, and as well as accelerators. We see a, we see a number of great accelerators um, deploying great uh, space companies and leading these companies to seed round and nucleating them. And that is empowering to me. I love it. And I couldn't, couldn't agree more. I mean, especially on the blockchain side, I think you're, you're spot on and with space, you're right. And I'll, I'll, for the audience, I'll grab Megan's article and share it with everybody in the, in the show notes afterwards. But uh, you're absolutely right. We're starting to see that ecosystem. I mean, Blockstream put satellites to create, put blockchain nodes up into uh, space, right? We saw the launch of Starlink, which we're gonna come back to um, in a few other areas and advancements in the recent months. But Noble, I saw you unmuted at one point, so I wanna come to you next. Where are you seeing as the current state of things around space uh, in in general? Are we going to the stars and beyond or are we still here for a little bit? You know, Irina really touched on something and I I really like uh, what she was talking about because we do FinTech. Right, and so we're in, and, and, and I think blockchain is kind of like, um, because we, we're so used to using that word, it, it's become ubiquitous, but I also think it takes away from the fact that it's just distributed ledger technology. And the, the core basis of the DLT, you know, you, like so my background, 26 years, I was a trader. So the core benefit of the DLT is a constant record spread out over literally a global neural network and that's really always kind of the part that's forgotten about the beauty of what we created we created a global supercomputer that allows us to do a holographic slices of information divided among everywhere and it's one of the things that when people were focusing on the byproduct uh, which is whether it's fits off bitcoin or ethereum or whatever the case may be they're missing the fact that we harness a global computing system uh, literally within the last decade. And it's, and it's been an amazing tool. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys remember when SETI was utilizing background information inside of computers in order to search and scan through star data. And here we have a global DLT that allows us not only to do that, but compute and process a lot more information. So I think that the DLT that and the, and the multiple neural, neural, basically uh, uh, computer n- nodes that we have across whether it's Ethereum or blockchain or Lightchain or however people are using it, it allows us to do background computing in a way that we've never done before. And I think that we've just really scratched the, the surface of what the DLT does. 
And when you start harnessing that ability and you integrate the concepts of AI and processing all that data, we've created such a magnificent uh, global network to really drive forward almost any innovation because the computing power doesn't have to just sit in large box rooms like IBM used to have, right? Where you need, uh, you know, tens of thousands of square footage and tens of thousands of fans and cooling systems in order to drive uh, the ability for the computing and processing power. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're always going to start digging deeper into the deep tech, but the reality is, you know, all this is a convergence, as we always talk about, of the singularity. You know, we have quantum uh, processing uh, literally here that's been tested. And you combine all of these layers together, we have a real benefit of what the future may hold. Uh, as, as we kind of, it, it has always been the question of how do you get people to adopt it? And payment systems, I think, are the most basis form of it. I don't think that that's really what it was designed for. It's capable of doing it. But I think that's the least important component of how the DLT functions and, and operates. But as you leave forward, it's the same thing in space. I think that this idea of commercialization of space uh, misses kind of the force for the trees. You know, there's a great article that came out and you know, I'm, I'm getting, getting old, I guess, because I don't remember uh, all the titles and names of everybody. But there's a great article that came out uh, and uh, is by, give me a second, let's make sure I want to do a proper citation so you can add it, uh, by Paul Sutter. And Paul Sutter is talking about the, the need to bring a particle collider to the moon. And I think that a lot of innovation starts with us looking at the practical applications of what space can do for us beyond the commercialization. So one of the ideas, one of the reasons why they're thinking about going to the moon to build a particle collider uh, is threefold, right? The, domestically, a particle collider needs to have air removed and there's no atmosphere on the moon. You need to keep super cool temperatures for it to operate. The moon is already operating sub-zero. And at the end of the day, because you can del deliver information back to Earth as one-sided space, you can consist consistently do two things. Number one, they talk about providing neutrino energy back to the Earth, almost as a broadcasting to be studied, as well as being able to delay, relay information back. The reason why I bring that up is that we right now have uh, expeditions literally in uh, Antarctica for a lot of these reasons, to study and understand the atmosphere, to then take that same concept and then create a, a scientific base on the moon first, and then build commercialization around that, makes the most sense. And it makes it clear because then things like Irina talked about, and as we talk more about some of the other uh, supply chain issues, then it makes sense because you're building up a scientific community that does need DLT to track items uh, be able to keep and catalog scientific experiments. What we have yet to do is really create a full-blown use case. We know we want to be in space, but mm -hmm. without a use case that allows us to build an infrastructure, the same reason why California was built. People came because of gold. The gold rush, 1849, uh, different, it's always been a resource grab. First, there were people who are coming in to build the infrastructure, the ones who are in desire of whatever that resource is, and then the commercialization of that location based on building around that mining town. We saw an explosion uh, most recently in South Dakota. I mean, we, this is like the, this is how human operation functions. There's no oil, but then all of a sudden they discovered that you can do sideways drilling, you can find other ways. And now in South Dakota, it costs almost a million dollars to buy a property. When before you could have bought something for $40,000. It's first focusing on the practical applications of what space can offer and then finding a close location. And you know, I, I'm really liking the idea of building scientific centers first on the moon and then utilizing all that technology to feed it and then growing out the commercialization. So I think the sensationalism and then, you know, and we, we love Tesla, you know, you can't talk about space without Elon Musk, to be honest. Uh, but the commercialization of space can't precede the scientific need for creating a resource rich environment that comes back to the earth that then will create a true commercial enterprise. Well, and, and hopefully we don't have every, you know, terrifying science fiction movie happen at once and all of a sudden <laughs> alien takes place. And, uh, you know, that one little piece of rock we bought, brought back, that one mi mineral, all of a sudden, you know, 
has alien popping out of us. But all jokes aside, I think you're, you're spot on. And I've, I've read it as well, a number of subjects and articles around the, the future of mining and the power of mining, even just you know, a minute asteroid that's coming across, right? Slow, but fast moving. And how we can mine some of the uh, basic materials we have here on, 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 on Earth that we're a little shy of. And even looking at gold and, and some of these other materials um, as well that make up our cell phones, which people forget how many rare earth materials. So I'll just add, the thing that, that a lot of those articles talk about is how rare earth materials, so there's a, a small number of what is called rare earth materials. These are rare earth-based materials currently that help make up the electronics that power our lives today. And they help power the semiconductors, they help the microprocessors. I mean, I'm not buzzwording here, I'm, I'm being honest with you. So take a look at that. And the thing is, is there's only a finite amount of these and we have yet to be able to recreate those. So once they're gone, they're gone. But there has been some studies done that we could go and mine, realistically go mine asteroids or comets and things coming across or even the moon to grab the enrichment from those. So I think you're, you're spot on on that. And, Noble, I had a second, and then Irene, and then Wally and Gary, get ready, because we're coming to you. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to throw in, in, in one of the things that you, you just brought up, it's not just rare earth metal, it's rare gases. We have a mm -hmm. finite amount of helium on this planet that runs CAT scan machines, it runs a significant number of just technology. And one of the issues is that we're in depletion. And the fact is, I think that depending on who you say, who you, you know, what research you look at, right? It's we're 70 years from depleting our entire our entire helium source. It's not like it's some kind of long magnanimous time. And so, without helium, it's kind of something we've taken for granted that there's something that's lighter than air that's on the Earth. But these are the things that we have to kind of, again, to see your point, look at as we start looking at resource grabs that are existing and abundant in the universe that are not here. And, you know, one of the biggest pushes that we personally do is we just don't buy helium balloons just for that reason. I don't think it helps, but <laughs> it's one of the issues that we have to be cognizant of that we can't just continue to burn resources. And there's better, there's a lot of resources, like you said, that we just kind of take for granted, like it's water or just air and it's not. So it's something to keep in mind. Irina, you had a, you had a point. I, I wanted to add that um, when people think about asteroid mining, they think that it's a science fiction often, but there are a number of countries that already have policy laid out for what it looks like and what the guidelines are. And founder of um, Space Fund, Rick Tomlinson, have been a leading um, expert um, and advisor to US government and other governments as well, um, advising exactly on that. So there are a number of co countries in the world right now that already have legislation that describes what this asteroid mining would look like. And there are a lot of countries that are in the process of figuring that out too. So it's much closer than we think. Which is exciting and also, uh, uh, you know, exciting to see science fiction come to, to reality, but a little terrifying and also a little bit, uh, you know, open questions. And, and, and that's what I mean by, by a little bit worrisome is there's so much that goes into a business of that nature, right? And that industry itself. But let's hold there. Gary, I want to come to you. I mean, we've talked a lot about space, but you're the guru of artificial intelligence. Where is kind of the current state of AI as a deep technology applied uh, kind of throughout uh, these areas and other industries that we've spoken about. Um, yeah, and, sure. Or, let me, let me Wally, just, we're coming to you next, so get ready. Let me paint a little picture, Kyle. Let's just think about this. This is recent data from 2013. By the way, I just wrote an article in Forbes about the, uh, the road to Mars, AI and the road to Mars. So it's not published yet, it's just coming out. But let me tell you something incredible. There are 40, billion estimated by the Kepler project, 40 billion Earth-like planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. To put it Earth-like, that means close enough to a sun they could have life like Earth. And not a lot of people know this, but there are 100 billion galaxies. So 
40 billion Earth-like planets in just our galaxy, and there are 100 based on the Hubble telescope, right? So let's say it's just a portion of that. There's a lot out there. Now, let's take another challenge. From the year 1800 to today, the population of the world went from 1 billion to 7.8 billion. In the last 100 years, the population of the Earth has quadrupled. What's going to happen in another two or 300 years? Where are we all going to live? What is going to happen to all the resources? So when we look at space as a frontier, this is the time for us to get out. So you talked about AI. I mean, AI, we talked about yesterday about uh, my friend David Yang and partner's house, Morpheus. But let me tell you, that technology today is being used. So it's called Seaman. So the Crew Interactive Mobile Companion. And it was developed by the European Space Agency, directly used to help astronauts and cosmonauts better adjust psychologically and physically to space. It's a 3D printed robot. So these technologies today are there. So take the same smart assistants that we have, Alexa, Siri, expand them, talk about the house that we talked about yesterday, Morpheus. This is today. So the satellites, the data. So Noble was talking about asteroids and that kind of thing. So imagine the satellites. So there's a couple, what Invasat is one, for instance, Skysat. Those satellites are out there using artificial intelligence, recently deployed with a, up to 150 uh, terabytes of data in a day, looking to see what's going to happen in space, looking to see what's out there that's going to come in. So that tomorrow is today. So what we have is a phenomenal opportunity for artificial intelligence, because that data is streaming at us in such an incredible way that we've got to make sense of it. There are dangers to our planets. And by the way, there are, you know, we don't know what's out there, right? We're just beginning. We're an infant. We're not even a toddler. We don't have a clue what's going to be out there. Are there other folks out there? Are there other beings out there? Where are these planets? Who knows? But the closest planet is 12 light years away. That's uh, Proxima Centauri. We have a great opportunity as explorers to not think about just mining, but think about the, this universe. Think about the galaxy. Let's explore it. Let's figure out how to be able to travel differently, you know, beyond uh, traveling at the speed of light, because we wouldn't get there. How do we travel differently for a wormhole, as Stephen Hawking said, et cetera. So I think AI is going to help us as an assistant. It's going to have some, help us process massive amounts of data. And it's going to help us be able to live our lives better and to get out. Because another two or 300 years, think about it. It quadrupled in the last 100 years to, what, eight, uh, 8 billion. So now, if it quadruples again, and it quadruples again, where are we going to be? Where are those resources? Forget about uh, MRIs. I'm going to be thinking about how much we're going to be able to breathe. Mm -hmm. Right? How much oxygen? What's going to happen to the, you know, the uh, ozone? Those kind of things. So we need to figure out where we could live in another, in another 500 years. Are we going to really be able to live here? I don't think so. Right? We're well, going to have to. And you're bringing up. That. Yeah, and you're bringing up great points. And you know, I, I, I like to always think about science fiction and, and bringing science fiction to life because sometimes science fiction if at, its, uh, at its surface can be a little terrifying and it can paint a very bleak or, or dark picture, but truly it can actually open your eyes to the future of innovation and the future of where we may be going. And you know, one thing you touched on is, is the idea of smart assistance and how that will play a role into even just the changing of travel. And the first thing that came to my mind was a science fiction movie. Uh, solo for my Star Wars uh, fans out there and how, you know, artificial intelligence played a role in the advancement of the Millennium Falcon. Yes, I'm nerding out. I apologize. But there is a point and before that AI was implemented into the ship, uh, you know, travel at a light speed was not was not possible. Mm -hmm. And that actually changed again. I understand it's science fiction people, but do hear me out here. It changed the way that they looked at travel. And mm -hmm. it, to us, these technologies, the deeper technologies that, again, do not face the end users, they actually empower and act as an infrastructure. These are changing the way that we think and do things. 
And you know, we're, we're about to get to quantum computing and to talk about edge because that's another level up of this, right? We, we bring blockchain in this, we bring space travel, we bring satellites, we bring AI to empower and leverage that data. Now, Wally, I'm coming to you, you know, talking about bio, talking about you know, advanced materials, talking about edge and the future of connectivity. Where are we with these current states? Because this plays a role. I mean, Irene is talking about us making payments in space, which is necessary, but also just in a general, I mean, how does the future of connectivity look uh, as we go to the edge, not just here on earth, but maybe even further than that? So uh, where, where are That's the great. current states in your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like the, uh, the discussion. I think uh, we, we were talking, we were talking about, about uh, pushing our limits to the further, uh, basically go, go going much further and further but uh, to the other ex extreme we can go to tiny and tiny so the I think I, I think the whole bio and uh, med tech innovations in the past decade is to really drill down to the to the to the basically the DNA level so that is actually a big advance uh, basically a breakthrough over the past 10 years especially those technologies like CRISPR where people can editing the uh, people can edit the DNA at their will. So uh, I, I think there's a couple of interesting already um, application level of this, uh, those breakthroughs in biotechnologies um, and material technologies. One is that I actually see some startups that are using DNA to store the information. So they basically combine uh, the, um, the biology with the information technology and uh, using the uh, ATGC to store our basically um, the, the, the information, the bits. And uh, they are still in the early stage, but uh, drag, uh, attracts quite a bit of uh, the uh, capital. There's a, a few companies doing that. I think in the coming years, we will see some initial uh, product that launch that you can use a just a finger sized um, like, um, like uh, packed DNA uh, to store a, a library, for example. So those are actually what I think is actually the world is shrinking because of our, uh, basically the, uh, we, we can analyze and also process the DNA level of data. So that is actually a very interesting. And the second aspect is that once we know more about our whole genomes, we can actually, um, basically um, analyze the whole, uh, the, the, uh, the whole nature at a much larger scale. So before a lot of the, the disease that we cannot treat um, and also the uh, talking about those uh, chronic disease and also cancers, we, we have a much better understanding over the past five years. And I, I've, uh, I'm, one of my thesis or areas of focus in is using the AI or using more data analytics tools combined with those uh, basically what we call the multi omics data that can actually better diagnose those disease and also finding the better uh, therapeutics. So what I think is uh, really, we've talked about this in the coming years in this whole um, diagnosis and uh, treatment stage, we can actually see a lot of the advance um, especially under this COVID, we already see the, the uh, new mRNA type of vaccine is developing at a much, much faster speed than the traditional vaccine development process. So in the past decade, we talk about that software is eating the world and people are talking about the cloud is eating software. I think right now we are seeing the same thing is actually happening in the, uh, um, biotech and math tech where software or data or artificial intelligence is eating the whole um, like, um, uh, uh, biotech space. So that's what I think is actually very exciting. Um, and also beyond that, I also look very deeply into the, <clears throat> in general, the travel, but more on the earth. So we talk about those autonomous vehicle or autonomous trucks and also uh, ro robotics and deliveries. I think that's actually happening um, in the next uh, few years. I mean, we, we, I mean, Waymo, those are like uh, already a hype in the past 
five years, but with the current uh, recent, uh, for example, the uh, Amazon's acquisition of Zooks, we actually see a couple of scenarios that are actually having some um, more promising to sh see the real uh, applications or real, um, we, we, I'm actually pretty promising, in, especially in those autonomous delivery scenarios. So right now here in Mountain View, I already see some robotics that are doing those in the downtown Mountain View area that sometimes block the traffic, but we, we are seeing this are actually happening a true autonomous, meaning no safety guy in the car or in the vehicle. And I'm thinking that I'm also focusing quite a bit on the development of the sensors over the past several years. So we can actually see the hardware is actually accelerating that autonomous, true autonomy happening, especially uh, the reduce of the size and the cost of the LiDAR and increase the, the basically the accuracy of the cameras combined with the new AI uh, algorithms that uh, those talent teams are developing. So I'm actually seeing that is also happening um, quite a, in a short term. Yeah, and this is, you know, this plays into the, the next kind of question I want to bring all of to you guys is, mm -hmm. we've talked about all these technologies, they sound amazing and very exciting, but there's challenges that come with each of these, right? Autonomous vehicles we've been talking about for years, but we're just now getting there. Was it technology or were there other roadblocks? No pun intended. Biotech, the same thing. Blockchain, AI, uh, space, all of these, again, very exciting industries, but what are some of the challenges that you're seeing you know, founders experience or investors experience when looking at these industries? Because we do want to solve those, right? We want people to understand the risks and the opportunities. So what are some of the challenges you're seeing to these industries really being able to advance um, uh, quicker? And Wally, I want to start back with you on biotech and also just autonomous and again, edge as a whole. Where are you seeing those challenges exist for people who may be building in this space? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a billion dollar question. So those are like, there's, um, I, I normally I, I see the, I mean, as an investor, we need to basically analyze all those risks and trying to understand which risks are we, we can, we can solve in the short term, which are like long-term risks or very hard to, to break. So, um, if I talk about the, in the biotech space, I think right now, the, the major challenge is that we have so much incumbents in the industry. So all those pharma companies, they're too big, too big to fail. I mean, that's, uh, that's not a, that's the reality. So the, it's very hard for a technology um, disruptor to really challenge the whole industry. So a lot of the time you see the, basically the big farmers, they have their own, for example, they have their own pipeline and they have their own value chain. And it's very hard to kind of like embrace or give up their existing, for example, the drug development process to embrace the new drug development process, even though in the academic or in the, in the more um, uh, startup world, people are already talking about, a lot about using, like, for example, using GAN, generative adversary um, network to create those new molecular but it's very hard for the big farmer to adapt that. So it really is about the, how can we change the whole value chain? So I look at the startup or the entrepreneur finding a very unique value proposition to at one hand, uh, at one aspect to, to collaborate with the farmers. At the other hand, also having their own pipeline and become a big farmer themselves. So that's, I think it's um, quite a challenging. In the autonomous vehicle, I think it's also pretty much similar. So we talk about those, uh, I think that's a topic for the past five years, people talk about those uh, big uh, OEMs and also big, big tier ones in the, auto, in, the, in the basically automobile industry. And those are also incumbents, very hard to, to challenge. But what I think is right now, after a few years of kind of fighting or the, all the autonomous vehicles raise hundreds of millions, uh, I mean, entrepreneurs are already finding their way 
to try to monetize or try to be capital efficient to bring to the market their end product bypassing those incumbents. So that's what I think is very, very promising. So I think that's um, especially in those, for example, delivery, where a lot of new economy, those are the uh, early adopters, like uh, those we talk about the Uber, we talk about those Amazon, they are quite in, uh, tech driven and uh, innovative. So I think that is more promising. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in general, I think for the entrepreneurs to disrupt such a great industry by a disruptive technology always, always is about the, uh, how, to, how you find a unique proposition to challenge those incumbents. Absolutely, and, and Noble to you, same thing in space. I mean, what's kind of holding you or what, what do you see as some of the challenges for companies to really be successful and start thriving in that, that space? Well, you know, you, you know while, while you uh, brought up, you know, before you jumped to space, I think it, it really is uh, what's happening here on Earth that makes all the challenges, right? So we look at uh, CRISPRs, and this is something that you know, I've been tracking for quite some time. Uh, you know, we, we look at, you know, you, there's no way not to talk about space and the future and current technology without looking at science fiction as kind of our uh, moral and uh, ethical uh, ability to see what could happen, right? So Asimov, Bradbury, all these guys were already futurists far ahead of their time. Uh, in what they imagine, Ray Bradbury, uh, what they imagine the next world would look like. And we've been trying <clears throat> very hard to utilize a lot of those stories to drive ourselves and our technology in a way that's both ethical and moral. Uh, but some of the things don't necessarily translate, right? So you had Asimov, you know, you know three laws of robots. These things, uh, you know, harm no one, humans before all. These are things that we are trying to figure out a way to implement uh, with human fallibility. You know, CRISPRs uh, is the byproduct of a lot of the cloning experiments that have been banned uh, long before uh, Dolly the Sheep and, and the like. I think part of the fact that we do not have a true international governing body of science and technology that is devoid of politics actually holds us as a species back because everyone is highly tribal on things that are both scientific and uh, have the benefit or the ability to benefit humanity as a whole, but because of politics, uh, tribalism, political lines, even within their own countries, we have found ourselves hamstrung by the human uh, fallibilities of both jealousy, secrecy, and the need to uh, basically be first to make a profit. You know. Ray Bradbury, or let's look at Gene Roddenberry, the only reason why uh, Star Trek exists is that it is, and nobody really pays attention to it, but it's truly a global militarized mission of a planet that has decided to go to space as one unity and create and take the best of the best and go and explore. We have yet to even be able to handle our own internal politics countryside. And so it becomes a very difficult uh, way to navigate when you have layers upon layers of both rules, regulations, and no real focus either on the scientific method and a need in order to drive the help of humanity as a whole. So a lot of the technologies, whether they are biological, because the minutia is very, you know, is very key. You know, we can't go to space without doing some significant bioengineering for human beings. We're just too fragile creatures to be in space. There's two, the various multiple forms of radiation, et cetera. Uh, you know, we look at uh, anime, which is another great futurist. You know, they have a whole uh, uh, cartoons or animes based on human beings who are able to process solar energy because our mitochondria DNA is not too much different from plants and utilizing even a fraction of our ability to uh, change us to modify solar energy would allow us to not have to, to be able to be in space. So there's these things that we know futuristically wise that we can experiment and test with, but unfortunately, because we don't have a global mandate and because we don't have a, a, and we're all afraid of each other here, I think that a lot of technology becomes very difficult, not only for space, but even domestically. You know, we could have had autonomous vehicles. Uh, we, I mean, let's, let's go with the most basic uh, of technologies that people ignored. We could have had electrical vehicles 100 years ago. Uh, this has been a, 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 
a whole line of technology that was stymied and killed by both uh, the petrol industry and the rubber industry. And yet it took us almost 100 years to finally get to uh, lithium ion batteries. And now they're working on carbon ion batteries, which are phenomenal, which have lesser time. And these are things that we know, but have so much entrenchment in both the current system, as well as uh, us having a deep distrust in one another. So I think that, you know, what, what holds us back uh, is a species is the same thing that propelled us forward. You know, we're naturally adventurers and explorers and we want to drive forward. But I think that unless we come up with some form of a separate entity or a global body, a full unifying ability to get out to space will always be these patchwork models that are popping up. And I, and I think we're bit by bit getting better. So there's no doomsday in that conversation, but it makes it very difficult uh, for one to wrap their heads around us being global. And I think, which is interesting, this pandemic has kind of started having these global conversations because people are interacting from Russia and Asia and America. And, you know, we're sitting on this screen and you know, I've been on a couple other uh, of these events and, you know, 12 and eight and nine different countries and nations are all interacting simultaneously. And we have yet, you know, this was science fiction, right? Nobody, you know, had ever done that before. And so now, oh, now we're here. I mean, but now we're, we're here. now so, here, which is which is exciting. But I, I want to make sure. So, so I apologize. I I have to interrupt because we're coming close to time. So I want to make sure Irene, Irina, and Gary get a chance to get in here as well. But you're making an absolute point. Science fiction once written, once thought, only imagined. Now it's finally here, and we're missing that gov that governing body, that regulatory on a global scale to help each other really power through this. And I think we're getting there in terms of collaboration, right? There's more happening today than ever. And Irene, I wanna to come to you around both space, but also blockchain as well. I mean, what's some of the challenges you're seeing in deep technology that uh, we really need to overcome as, as founders and investors uh, to push these things forward? Yeah, I think that the biggest challenges really come in from the lack of funding. And that lack of funding goes across the border. When we think about science, when we think about bioscience, when we think about um, redefining the way we travel, it all comes down to kind of a career suicide, okay? So if you're a scientist and you go against mainstream media, it is very challenging to get continuous funding. So you have to have a very heavy wealth behind you to be able to do that. To get published your work, it's nearly impossible. And I think that's one of the things that we can do as investors that funds can do too, is really open up their minds to the bottlenecks of innovation. Um, I think that our science is um, reached to a point to where we cannot go and do things that we want to do based on old science. We live under assumption that we are no, we know everything there is, right? So, and this is very unpopular thing to say, but for example, gravity, nobody challenges the gravity and it must be challenged because all the innovation always comes from challenging outdated old knowledge. And that's where we live now. We live in outdated old knowledge. However, we have a lot of brilliant scientists that are working and that are starving. And so I think that the biggest bottleneck is the funding. And if we can provide funding to these projects all across the border from space to, to bio, to whatever it is, we'll be able to reach further to the skies, to the stars, literally and figuratively. Absolutely agree. And, and Gary, I mean, look, you've told me so much about this home. I want this home so bad. And the smart assistant, like now, um, what are some of the challenges? Why don't well, I mean, we I've taken an entirely different viewpoint So uh, than Irina. So in 2002, Elon Musk was doing Tesla, got out of PayPal and started SpaceX and people laughed. And look what he's been able to do in that period of time. 
So I believe it's not all about the funding. It's about having a vision and getting people to buy off on it. Look at it today. I mean, SpaceX is the number one uh, transporter of satellites in the world. And they started from scratch. So I think there's a great opportunity. And it's about finding that and thinking differently, using some of the technologies like we talked about the house yesterday. Those kind of smart assistants are the same kind of assistants they're going to be needed to be able to go to space. So adapt them. Velcro was made by the Russians. Not a lot of people know that for space. And now people take it for granted, right? Use the technology that we have and enhance it, adapt it for space. So I'm not sure all that funding needs to take place, but showing there's an opportunity. This is something we have to do and we've got to do it sooner or later. And we've got, a, we've got time, but not a lot of it to, to do it. I think it's great in terms of mining minerals, rare earth, it's great. But I'm more concerned about where we're going to be it as a civilization in another couple hundred years. So I think the opportunity today, I think in terms of using existing technologies to go forward is great. I think using, using artificial intelligence to be able to help us get those answers is phenomenal. And, and I, I think uh, Irina has a point. So that's, that's really great that there are some um, privileged people that are in single numbers are, that are able to go and do the things that they've done. However, for us to be able to really implement the innovation, we need to be able to do it across the border. And for the most part, when those innovators, when those people that think outside of box, when they go and they talk to the funds, they do not get a penny. It's not only about the vision, but it really is in the end of the day about the funding. Elon Musk is special. Elon Musk has a lot of good friends. What he's doing is amazing. But we need a global society of people. We need entrepreneurs to be able to go and be able to think outside of box. Biotechnology is extremely challenging to raise funding for. If you are a scientist, and you are going against mainstream adoption, against mainstream rules, for the most part, you're canceled. And if we live in a society where you're canceled because you're speaking out outside of the box and because your innovation does not go with mainstream media, and if we do not provide those people with funding, we're going to be dependent on a single number of people who are only visionaries. We need to be able to fund this. If I, we- You know, Irina, I think you got a great point, but I got to tell you, I think differently. And I'm from yeah, Silicon Valley, right? So the Steve Jobs and, of the world, the David Yangs of the world. I mean, those people have done it. They've started from nothing. They've done it. They've got consensus. There are ways to do it. And part of it is having a network just like we are in this show to be able to get the word out. So I think if we entitle people and we take that kind of path, nothing good's going to happen. When we went up to space and the space race happened, look what happened in 10 years, right? We put somebody on the moon. So part of it is, you know, creating a sense of urgency and adapting technologies that we have. And I think if we start entitling it, nothing but, you know, we're going to have a, a, a fat society. I don't agree with you on that side. And I think that's why the beauty of Silicon Valley and the innovations that have come out of there are really, really helpful. And I believe anybody can do it with the vision, right? Let's use, yeah, let's oh, use cancer research. Hold on, hold on, okay. hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because <laughs> if, if I let this continue, all three of you, and poor Wally and I are gonna be quiet. All three of you will talk over each other. So he, here's, here's what I'm hearing. Let me try to summarize real quick. There, there is a need for capital, right? First off, there's a need for vision. Let's be clear. There is a need for vision. Whether you're the Elons, the Steve Jobs, the who's who, there is a need for a vision to reach for the stars, all puns intended on our topic today. There is a need for a vision. There is need for an ecosystem of any kind of support, right? We've talked about it on previous episodes of what ecosystems include, governments, to investors, to entrepreneurs, to resources, to universities, to capital markets and beyond. There needs to be pieces, if not the whole ecosystem, to support you. Three, there needs to be capital and not just $10. There needs to be hundreds, thousands, tens of millions of plus of dollars. 
There needs to be capital to support you and not just investment capital because that's not what building a business is about. To Gary's point as well, there needs to be revenue. There needs to be a business as there as well. There needs to be a use case that you're solving for. And then there needs to be buy-in. You know, the reason we were part able to go to the moon in 10 years and do some of the amazing things we were is that there was a bigger picture buy-in. And I think everyone's making that same point. And Gary, I don't mean to, to take away. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's why the valley is the valley in Silicon Valley is because there is those pieces. There is the buy-in that this is the place to come or was. We'll leave it at that. This was the place to come to build anything in terms of advancement and in, in innovation and technology. But now, as we look at, to your point of globalization and us advancing as a society, because I agree, and there's some deep uh, you know, philosophy in there of where we go, and I'll, I'll let us unpack that on a one-on-one -on -one episode. But um, nonetheless, we need that bigger buy-in. As a society, we need as either consumers or as enterprises or technologists, that we want to see our, you know, um, our geno genomics. We want to see biotechnology advance, right? We want artificial intelligence a part of our lives. We want trust. We want transparency. We want to go somewhere new. So to summarize all of this, it sounds like each of you are calling out very strongly, and I, I will leave it at that because I respect all of that opinion very strongly that we need these ecosystem pieces, whether it's in a whole or one, at the end of the day, we need it all. And so whether it's space, whether it's AI, whether it's bio, whatever, we need those ecosystems to exist because without them, the shit doesn't work. And I apologize again for, for using that word, but it just, it doesn't work, right? You can't just have funding to your point and everything be perfect. You can't just have visionaries without resources and support. You can't have any of this without buy-in at any level. You can't have big monopolies running and owning an industry without allowing for innovation on a smaller scale. So I think every single person, you guys are all spelling out the biggest problem here is the lack of a true ecosystem, a full ecosystem to support all of these areas, but it's coming. I mean, AI, I don't mean to take this from the audience or the, from the panel, but AI, we know that ecosystem's there. We know it's coming with blockchain, We'll just leave it at that. There's something there. When it comes to bio, there's still some work. When it comes to space, you know, Gary mentioned that we're in the baby steps. We're in the early days when it comes to the bigger industry of space and that ecosystem coming together. But Irina and her team and, and groups that she and Noble are working with, they're bringing this together. So to the audience, our investors and our entrepreneurs, ecosystem, be there and supportive, whether that's buying into the big vision of Elon and others, whether that's funding these projects, whether that's providing education like we do, to Gary's point again, on talking about these things, be a part of the ecosystem, be involved. If you're not involved, you can't complain that something's not happening, right? If we're not going to space and you're complaining about how we're not going to space, guess what? Are you doing anything to solve the problem? If not, no. If you are, join us on VCTV to join the argument and the discussion. But I'm going to pause there and I'm going to go to the kind of next question because I think it's relevant is, you know, where are the areas of opportunity? Where, if you're thinking about investing in artificial intelligence, you're investing in bio, you're investing in edge, you're investing in space, you're investing in these, where's the opportunity? Where should we as investors be looking at that's not yet talked about uh, in these areas as opportunity? So Gary, I'm going to come back to you because I interrupted all three of you. Poor Wally sitting over there just listening to all of this. First timer, Wally, don't get scared. This is this is a good conversation. <laughs> These are all good yeah, points. Yeah, it is. Very good. Gary, I want to come to you. Where should we be looking at as areas of opportunity in this space? I mean, you know, what we do is we go to places that have incredible scientific talent, places like Israel, places like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, that have incredible talent, incredible math and science capabilities, and to be able to, to uh, work with those types of uh, individuals, whether they be professors or students or um, entrepreneurs, and to be able to help them commercialize their activity, to be able to create it, to package it. As you said, you do need an ecosystem 
So if we find the raw material, what we want to do is be able to mold it to be able to turn it into something incredible. And I think that we haven't done enough of that as a society. And I don't mean just there, whether it's in China, whether it's in Malaysia, whether it's in California, it doesn't matter, wherever that talent is, but be able to bring it together. So it's critically important for conversations just like this to bring people together. I mean, that's what we do with GSD. We look at those kind of companies to be able to pack it, to make something that's incredible, will solve these kind of problems. And that involves getting capital, that involves helping them package it in terms of operations, the whole nine yards. So it is critically important to package it, to get it ready for the market, to at least test it. Absolutely. And that I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And again, if you're looking at building an artificial intelligence, you're not talking to Gary, you're doing yourself a disservice. Get get with that gentleman. All right, Noble to you, where are the opportunities in space? I mean, you painted in, in FinTech and AR, VR, so augmented and virtual reality. Um, I mean, you painted a very exciting picture uh, yeah, about know. us going in a holographic way. So where, yeah. where are the opportunities as investors? So for me, I'm, I'm knee deep, you know, I, I have a patent on augmented reality and the, the uh, intersection of that and product items. And so with that being said, I'm 100% bought in the idea that extended reality and digital science is really where people should invest. I believe that interstellar travel is capable by, you know, to Wally's point, it becomes very difficult to start looking at a macro way without looking at multi-generational opportunities there. You know, of course, we want to save the planet and we want to use the technology we have to get to space. But in lieu of that, we still need explorers. And I really believe things such as Oculus and Magic Leap and uh, where that component is going makes it accessible and you know an avatar really showed us what that means you know when you have the ability to 3d print a robot then you can send 3d printed robots all across the universe and then you, you know literally inhabit them virtually to explore it becomes a huge uh, intersection of two technologies so i really am, i'm a big fan of uh, everything on this the panel's talked about but for us specifically uh, the focus is always going to be on augmented reality and extended reality and how we intersect technology, uh, digital technology, how we intersect with the world. I love it. Wally, where are the yes. opportunities so, that lie here? Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I, I mean, from the investor perspective, there's full of opportunities. That's the reason why we are doing our job. Basically, we see a lot of uh, big opportunities, small opportunities. So. Um, I think in general, we, we, I can echo back by what I was uh, talking about, about the, the, um, uh, the bio space. In the bio space, I think, as I mentioned, using multi-omics, meaning like not just your DNA data, but also your RNAs and your MRIs, your uh, everything, to doing um, a personalized treatment and also diagnostics. That's what I think is definitely tons of opportunities there. And uh, one small area that I also found very exciting is in the bio, uh, the microbiomes, uh, basically microbiomes, DNA and RNAs. That's also, um, a, a, I mean, a new type of diagnostic and treatment uh, will, will happen because people understand about their own genomes, but not the, their environment. And uh, so the, uh, in, the, in the edge space that I've invested in recently, a company, uh, Kyle, you know, Edgeworks, and I think uh, I focus very much on, I think that uh, for the entrepreneurs to focus on delivering an end-to-end -end solution in any verticals that you think the ad computing or the AI can, um, can disrupt. So there's some tons, for example, in hospitals, in, the, um, in, in schools, in public sectors, there's many areas leveraging AI to push on the edge to doing like a smart camera, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's many opportunities there that I see, especially under this COVID, um, a, a tons of the customer experience and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the real world experience will be, will be um, slightly like uh, twisted towards in, in the next few years because of this, um, basically the whole um, environment change. So that's what I think is also very exciting. Arena. Yes. Well, 
Um, let's talk about space first, um, since I think that's the kind of a, the more innovation topic. Um, the beauty of space now is that we have a really diverse community of companies that are available right now. A lot of them are already in revenue. And th just to your point that, you know, there's an innovation to things that we're looking forward to the future. And then there are really companies that's been around for 10 years now. Uh, we've had space as a, a free enterprise for a little bit over 10 years. And um, we now finally see the seeds that were planted 10 years ago kind of be sprouting out. When I think about space, I think about transportation and transportation, not just how to get from here, because we kind of have that solved um, and in, in an innovation sort of way as well, but also communication. We need to think about the communication. As we are reaching further, we need to see, think about you know, how, how do we stay in contact with our planet? Um, we need to think about human factor, habitats, life support, um, biomedical, you know, to Wally's point, in order for us to be able to go further and explore all the, all the habitats that Gary mentioned, we really need to think about how do we adopt and how do we change our biology and support our biology. Um, robotics is very, very important. Supply chain is very necessary. Um, when we think about a supply chain, we think about raw materials and mining. Um, just to be able to travel farther than we can right now, we need to be able to mine and produce um, outside of our planet, right? Um, we need to think about that means that we need to think of um, manufacturing and production. And of course, energy. We need to be able to capture and create energy and uh, really understand um, kind of what different new sources of energy that we can, uh, we can have. The beauty is that it's all available now. These are, there are companies all over the world that are actually building solutions for that. If you go to spacefund.com and you scroll down, you will see um, space rating. Um, and you will be able to see all the categories that are basically available. Um, and you will see ability to, you will see companies to, in which you can invest. And I would love and encourage investors to vote with their dollars, not just for the large companies that require billions and billions of dollars, but a medium stage companies, a B round um, fundraising is very important and it really does not exist. There's no VCs that deploy in a B, B C round of the space companies. So on spacefund.com, you can see references, you can see the companies, and most importantly, you can see the categories that are needed in order to be able to create the ecosystem. And if you're an entrepreneur, you can actually see, oh, I this is needed and there's not much competition in this, so maybe I will start this company. And luckily, there are early stage VCs that already exist. Um, when we think about blockchain, I believe that the most innovation that we must see and we will see and we're seeing right now is in implementation of capital markets. Um, our systems are, our capital market systems are outdated. Everything is built on old, old systems. Everything goes back to when we used to use papers for everything, right? Um, we no longer need to use papers for things. We can save the trees and forego all the papers. So that's where blockchain technology comes in. Um, it allows us to kind of really connect the world, uh, capital markets world. Right now we live, to your point, Kyle, we live in segregated worlds. And um, a blockchain technology in a lot of ways allows us uh, to be able to eliminate the borders and create truly global wealth transfer, right? Connecting, connecting funding and connecting projects from all over the world is one of the biggest things that I am inspired of doing. I think that there are so many innovators all over the world that deserve the voice. They deserve the ability 
to be able to make their visions a reality. And right now they don't have it because of outdated systems. And we're going to get there. We are, yes. we're working together. The ecosystems are coming. Gary's going to power this all. So it's going to be perfect. Um, I can't wait. But uh, with that being said, I, you know, all jokes aside, but serious, he, he is going to power this all. Um, we're at the lightning round. So we've got two fun questions that I want to bring to the, uh, to the panel that I think are, are exciting um, to kind of spark this conversation. So quick answers for our audience, and then we'll get to closing thoughts and where everyone can find us. But First and foremost, we'll come around to everybody, quantum. Are we ready to go quantum? Is this something that's real? Is this really gonna change our life? Or is this a bunch of science fiction on paper and not yet really here? So quick answers, I know that's a little uh, not fair based on the big topic at hand, but would love to hear each of your quick uh, few second answer of are we ready to go quantum yet? Uh, so Noble, let's start with you. Are we ready to go quantum? You're on yeah. the microphone. Yeah, you. sorry about that. I could, uh, couldn't hit the mute button. But yeah, absolutely, 100%. You know, Ron's law dictates that quantum is what's going to happen. And uh, we need faster, cooler computers and computing power to solve all of these things uh, to, to do the computation. So uh, I'm 100% behind quantum, uh, quantum computing, period. I love it. Wally, I see you shaking your head ever since I yeah, asked that so question. The, um, so. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I forgot to mention quantum, but basically in the biospace that I'm tracking, I mean, quantum computing is the core bit is very good to analyze the, uh, the, um, the uh, basically the structural, to digest the structural information and produce a synthetic biology, um, I mean, recipes in, in, in short, I mean, we can actually um, produce new type of uh, sorry, um, basically new 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 type of like treatments. So that's what I think it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's something that we are hoping haven't seen. But uh, for sure, if there's quantum applications, for sure the bio space will will would love to to uh, to to see. There you go, building bio quantum. There's your guy, Irina. Are we ready to go quantum? Absolutely. We're so ready and we're seeing a lot of innovation all over. One of the great projects that I'm really, really passionate about, its name is uh, Supernature. And it's, it allow, it, it's based on actually defying the whole pieces of gravity. And they've done amazing work in the lab. It's amazing to see their little machine being able to multidimensionally move. And really, when I think about that, it allows us to be able to go and travel, you know, so, and there are many other projects, uh, we're getting closer than ever. And most importantly, the development of quantum allows us to be able to think outside of box. So it's not just applicable to technology, but to mindset, because when we think about quantum, we think of all the opportunities, we think of all the possibilities. And when people hear about it, they're allowing their mind expand. And to me, that's the kind of the most important thing. Absolutely agree. I'm reading a book about quantum right now and it's blowing my mind page by page. So I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Gary, are we ready to go quantum? You're on mute, my friend. In terms of artificial intelligence, I mean, quantum computer computers are natural. So, I mean, if we look at we look at Sycamore that uh, Google uh, developed. I mean, we're we're in a stage now with all this massive amount of information. As I've said many times around us, we have to be able to synthesize it. So, any way we can do that in timely fashion. Now, on one side, in what 2019, folks would say. Um, that one of the quantum computer scientists said he wasn't really sure if it's cracked up to what it what it's supposed to be. So remains to be seen, but we do need something that's massive that can synthesize this incredible amount of data around us. Awesome. Last question, quick answer. Yeah. Prediction for the year will hit singularity. Well, I mean, we're already started down that path, aren't we? It's not going to be one year. It's going to be mm -hmm. an. It's going to be very very gradual. And so we're going to see things, uh, nanobots, we're going to see all kinds of things happen around us, and it's going to be incremental. So 
you won't really know it's happened until it's really over. And they'll say, oh, I remember that. So it's happening now. There you go, Irina. I agree 100%. And um, we're, we're moving and we incrementally moving. And I believe we're speeding up faster and faster and faster. All the kind of innovations are now coming in together. We used to live in a world where we had one innovation and then there was a long time period, right? Between, yeah. And then those periods started speeding up. And now when we look at it, look at all of us. We, we could discover, there's so many of them and they're all coming in together and they're interdependent on each other. So yes. we are, we're living through it and it's our journey. Um, just like Gary said, to be able to take those incremental incremental steps and continue on forward. And one day we're going to be like, oh yeah, we're there. Noble. Yeah, you know, right now, I don't know if anybody's read the, the Post-Human series by David Simpson. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal. It's a sci-fi sci series, which is really delving deep into what potentiality of this singularity looks like. And the reality is, you know, we, we, we're here, the, I have to be honest, we're here, right? Mm -hmm. That people don't, there's nobody on this planet that goes almost anywhere in the industrialized world without a, a smartphone. And so the next level of that is to incorporate that in within us. And then the next phase of that is to integrate that with AI. Cause that's the only way we'll be able to let the wetware be able to communicate with the hardware. So we, we are at, you know, when, when people look back and they see how the uh, smartphone is, it was the extension of the human body, to be frank, uh, that will be the point of where they can point to and say singularity started. So we're, we're here. I mean, we, we can't go anywhere without technology. We can't function without technology. And this is the, the scary part of all that is that that's when the digital divide becomes far, far more worse because 50% of the planet still doesn't have running water. So that's it's... When uh, it's, you know, it's when the really robots rise. No, it's when the robots, robots rise. No, it's just, it's Gary's like, the only one that can protect right. us. No, it's Gary's really the only one that can. Yeah, Gary's <laughs> the only one that can protect Morpheus us. Morpheus will protect us. <laughs> Morpheus, we're all going to Morpheus. If you don't know what that is, get ready. Um, Wally, uh, to you, cool. what? Uh, when's the singularity? I, I don't have an answer, but I think uh, what I what I could do or what we hope to do is that we can live long as long as uh, we can actually see that or achieve that, which I think it's actually possible given the whole, the uh, advancement in the therapeutics. So cure those disease and also those chronic uh, disease and uh, those cancers. So I, what I think is that we can live a, a good and happy life and a longer life so that we are good, uh, good to see those uh, when, no matter when that will happen. Wonderful. All right, everybody. Time for closing thoughts and where can everyone find you? Wally, we'll come back to you and we'll come around. So Wally, at this point of the show, closing thoughts, anything you have left to add quickly. And then also where can everyone find you online uh, so they can connect afterwards? As I feel our audience based on everything I'm seeing is very interested to talk to each of us afterwards. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can, you can find me on LinkedIn and uh, also just uh, by, um, yeah, I have also my Twitter so it's uh, pretty straightforward to, to find me and love to, 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 to discuss more interesting topics. And uh, I'm actually covering from the early stage, but also I also invest in pretty late stage as well, a pre IPO company. So I see the basically every stage that I'm also, I mean, I see deals. So love to, to share more with other investors or with fellow entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think it's a, definitely a great uh, discussion. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a great honor to, to discuss with all the heuristic, I mean, those uh, new uh, innovations. Uh, as an investor, most of my daytime is more boring, kind of like I'm focusing more on whether the, the team or the company that I'm pitching to me can actually achieve that thing. So I, most of my time is so narrowly minded to that, those uh, validating those business opportunities. But I, I really enjoy the discussion uh, during this past uh, an hour to talk about all those uh, future things that are, I mean, f fine to uh, definitely a great, uh, great, uh, great chat. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely excited that you were able to join us today. And we're looking forward to having you back to talk about Edge and IoT here in a few weeks. Noble to you. Qu quick, quick, quick closing thoughts, because we're already over time. 
and then where can everyone find you? The quick closing thoughts is I think that, you know, people feel so grounded by what's happening with COVID-19 that it's very difficult to imagine what things look past, like past this. And so I think that that's, I love the platform like this that gives us the opportunity to be the human parts of ourselves using imagination and being able to use our futurism to hope for a better tomorrow. So I, you know, I appreciate being on here as always. And uh, I think that as an investor uh, and as people who bring in investors that we should constantly keep our eyes literally to the stars at Astra, because that's really where the, where human beings were meant to be. Absolutely. And uh, Irina. Well, Joe, you know, we are, we are made out of stardust. So it makes sense that our destiny is to reach further to the stars. Um, you can find me anywhere. Uh, my uh, my username everywhere is at Crypto Superwoman. I'm super active on basically everything. Um, I don't know how I find time, but you know, there's no time and space really. So that's kind of the theory that I live with, and it works for me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I would I would like to expand the, um, on on Noble's point that. You know, through through this challenging time when we stopped being able to travel and speak on big stages personally for me and, you know, have to kind of stay back. I think that a lot of us have got grounded and a lot of us realized how important our human connection is and how much of the same we are, no matter where we live in the world. And I believe that people are moving toward more compassion, more understanding for each other, and most importantly, toward more connectivity with each other. And so um, my hope is that we keep on innovating and we keep on building and that we build across the borders and work together no matter what country we are, no matter where we are, no matter what languages we speak, and we keep going further into the stars and we going, keep going deeper into ourselves, into ourselves, um, into literally ourselves and, and innovate and explore and, and grow together. Absolutely, and Gary, close us out, sure. closing thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And also your article, plug it. Yeah, so I just, uh, I'm publishing an article, the uh, AI, the path, the road to Mars. It's coming out in uh, Forbes magazine probably next week. So one, one uh, closing thought, stay positive. You know, the glass is not half empty. The glass is half full. And if you believe that, it'll help you no matter what you do in technology, it'll help you move forward. You can catch me on LinkedIn, Gary Fowler, Gary at GSDVS. Uh, or so, which is uh, Get Shit Done Venture Studios. So gsdvs.com is my company and we help incredible AI companies take it to the next level. So if you want to go to Mars, give me a call. There you go. Everyone, thank you so very much. If anything, I'm honored to have the chance to talk with each of you for the past hour and, and then some about not just what is science fiction, but what is reality, what is today and looking to the stars and beyond every bit of it. So thank you as well. And thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in today. As everyone has said, we're all available online pretty much 24 seven. You can reach out to all of us as investors and experts to talk about these things. Or if you've got a company, we'd love to hear about it. Also, if you liked what you heard today, make sure you click the subscribe button, give us a thumbs up uh, and we'll be back here tomorrow. But before we go, a big shout out to Elena and to the entire LA Token team who do such an amazing job bringing us together and helping to produce VCTV for you, our live audience. See you tomorrow as we talk about fundraising in this current era and for the next six to 12 months ahead. It's going to be another exciting episode. Continue to look to the stars and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody. I'm Kyle Lacott. Bye-bye.